Cool, like you said, my name is Kelly. I'm excited to be hanging out with you guys this week. And I just wanna start off by saying, I really appreciate the opportunity to share with you. And everything that I share this week uh, is not coming from me because I'm particularly great or wise or interesting, but because I love God and I want you guys to love God too. And so I wanna to talk, to talk to you guys about him and everything that I say and everything that we talk about this week, I want to just all point to how great God is and what he's done, not just for me, but for all of us. And throughout this week, I want you guys to know that if you want to talk about any of the stuff that we um, mention in chapel throughout the week, anytime, you guys are more than welcome uh, to talk to me, to hang out with me, and that they can be serious questions or comments or things like that, or they can be whatever. If you guys want to share a good joke with me, I'm down with that too. But um, I don't want to just talk to you guys this week. I really want to be with you this week. And so as we're kind of here together hanging out, um, I just hope that it won't just be about having chapel together as far as you guys and I go, but that throughout the whole week, it'll be great. And uh, I want to start off today telling you guys, since some of you know me, but some of you guys don't really know me, sharing with you a little bit about my past and when I was really young. And so I'm going to start this morning talking about when I was in kindergarten. And when I was in kindergarten, uh, I was very cool. You guys might not be able to tell now, but when I was in kindergarten, I was very, very cool. And I didn't know it at the time, but the, popular, uh, the correct term is popular. And uh, people wanted to hang out with me. People wanted to play with me. And, you know, I had a lot of things going for me. I could run really fast. I thought girls were really gross. And so, you know, that, those are good things. And um, so that was all going on in my favor, but after a little while, I realized that some of my popularity in kindergarten wasn't necessarily due just to my own set of unique whatevers, but was due to the fact that I had a really cool friend. And, uh, and that friend was Heart Bear. This is my, uh, my teddy bear from when I was young, Heart Bear, and he would he would uh, hang out with me when, when I was young, and we would spend a lot of time together. Heart Bear would come to school with me, and he was highly beloved. I mean, people wanted to be around Heart Bear, and why not? I mean, look. Yeah, you guys all want to hang out with him. And so, yeah. He's great, and uh, he was a very faithful companion, and you know, wherever I would go, uh, around that age, he would be there. If I was on the playground, he would be on the playground. If I was coloring, you know, this guy can color too. You know, it's really good, you know, partner to have whenever you're doing what you're doing. And in, in kindergarten, people all wanted to have a piece of friendship with Heart Bear. They all wanted to hang out, not just with me, but with me, because I had Heart Bear, and they knew that if they could hang out with me, you know, and if I was swinging on a swing, maybe they'd get a chance to get some time with him, because he was excellent. And he would do everything that I did, and I realized after a little while that he was actually maybe a little more popular than I was, and a big reason for my own popularity at that age. And no matter what, he was there, and no matter where I went, he was there. And all the other kids wanted to be around him, but as much as they wanted to do things with him, and as much as I let them sometimes hang out with Heart Bear, he only really had one owner. And he would always come home with me. He would always stay in my room. Um, when we got picked up, he and I would get in my parents' van and we would you know, go home or wherever we were going. He would always be there with me. He only had one owner, and that was me. And not only was I his owner in the way that it meant that I got to hang out with him, but it also meant that I was responsible to take care of him. My parents gave me some good guidelines at the time of things that I should do, things that I was supposed to do in order to make sure that I could have heart bear around, you know. So I, if it was raining, I might want to keep him out of puddles. And if I was fighting an imaginary battle, I needed to, you know, protect him, make sure he didn't get a mortal and fatal injury because that would be a disaster. And it's very dangerous for him because his heart's on the outside. <laughs> very vulnerable. So... You know, had to protect Heart Bear in those kind of ways. I had to make sure that he didn't get slammed in a car door, which did happen from time to time. I had to make sure he didn't get left behind on the playground. I had to make sure that none of the other kids took him or hurt him or um, anything like that. Just had to take care of Heart Bear so he didn't get hurt or lost. He belonged to me, and since he was my bear, I took care of him. 
And because I took care of him, he was always by my side. Because I took care of him, he was always around when I wanted him to be around. And as much as I loved him, which was a lot, I didn't take care of him perfectly. As much as I cared about Heart Bear, I didn't always do the best job of following all the guidelines that my parents had laid out for me. And in fact, there was one time when I actually lost him. I was playing on the playground and hanging out and doing some stuff. And you know how it is at that age, or maybe for some of you at this age, which is perfectly okay. But you know, when you see something that you want to do, if you want to swing or slide or run or chase somebody or squash a bug or whatever, you just go and do that thing. And if that happens, sometimes you might leave Heart Bear behind. And one day I got picked up from the playground and uh, drove, you know, got a ride home. I didn't actually drive, I was only five. Um, with my parents and I realized that I didn't have heart bear. And so we went back to go find him and he wasn't there. We went back to the playground and he was nowhere to be found. You know, went up and looked in all the areas and he was gone. There is no more heart bear. He had completely disappeared. Someone must have picked him up or maybe he went back into the wild, but there was no more heart bear to be found for me. I didn't follow the guidelines and I lost him and I still remember that to this day. And because I have great parents, they got me another heart bear. This is actually heart bear number two. He's not the original guy that I was talking about in that story. Um, and I really like heart bear number two, but just because I got heart bear number two doesn't mean that I forgot about the fact that I, I had failed heart bear number one. I didn't have him anymore. And it was all because of the fact that I had lost him and when I went back to find him, I couldn't rescue him. I couldn't get him back. There was nothing that I could do. And everything in my power that I could do to try and get Heart Bear back didn't work. No matter how hard I looked or for how long I looked, I could not find him. Now, I've just talked for a little bit of a long time about a bear. Thank you for letting me do that. It was very therapeutic. Um, but... There, it turns out, is a love that is stronger than a little child's love for a bear, even a bear that is as great as heart bear. And what we're here to talk about this week and what I want to talk about with you guys this week is the great love that God has for us and how incredible it is that a God like him, the mighty creator of the universe, the one who's over everything, the one who knows everything and who holds everything together, is the God who has chosen to love you and to love me knowing everything about us, knowing everything that you've ever done, thought, and said, knowing everywhere that you've been, knowing exactly who you are, every unlovable detail, that the God of the universe, the Mighty One, loves us. And there's a great example of how much God loves us and, and His perfect ability to rescue us in the book of Exodus. And what I love about this is because is that in my own life and in my own story with Heart Bear, I couldn't do anything to rescue him. It was outside of my power, but there is nothing that's outside of God's power. And if you look at the Bible, one of the most amazing things and one of the most consistent themes throughout the Bible is the fact that God rescues people who can't help themselves. That God saves people who can't do anything to save themselves. And he does not fail. We have a God who doesn't fail. There is nothing that's difficult for him. There's nothing that's hard for him. And when he tries to accomplish something, he accomplishes it because he's God. And so in the book of Exodus is the story of God rescuing his people and bringing them home. And what happens is, if, if you guys don't mind me just summing up for you, is that the Israelites had been uh, thriving in the land of Egypt and, and that freaked out the Egyptians and so they ended up making the Israelites who are God's people into slaves and they were a massive labor force for the Egyptians and they would do all kinds of things and they were living this rough life of slavery and the Bible says that God heard when his people cried out he heard their pain and their struggling and their anguish and he responded that God heard them and saw them when they're in slavery and he didn't leave them there and so he accomplished great miracles of all kinds of varieties to save his people from this slavery. And he pulled them out of this, this extraordinarily difficult life to live with him. He pulled them out of, of slavery to have a new life in a promised land with him. And he promised that he would be 
with his people. In fact, he actually brought his own presence down to lead them out of this land, and he rescued them. And it's a story that explains that God rescues his people who couldn't rescue themselves. That God saves people because they can't do it without him. And he didn't just want to rescue them and then set them free from slavery and then just leave them alone. But God wanted to set his people free from slavery so they could live a new life with the purpose of being with him. For, for example, when I went back to get Heart Bear from the playground when I had lost him, I didn't just want to save him from a playground. I didn't want to just bring him out of that dangerous situation. I wanted to get him so that he could be with me because I wanted to be with him. I wanted to go back and get heart bear so that I could continue having life with him. And so when God pulled his people out of Egypt, when he saved them from slavery, he didn't just do that, that because slavery is bad, but he saved them from slavery because he wanted to be with them. He wanted them to be able to live lives where they were free uh, to serve and love God with every part of who they were. And so when God rescued the Israelites, he wanted to be with them. And one of the things that he did in order to ensure he gave them rules to explain exactly what it meant to live life with him, to tell them exactly how to do it, to put them in a position to succeed. He gave them the law because he had saved them. And for the next couple days, in fact, throughout this whole week, we're going to be camping out in a couple chapters of Deuteronomy. Um, between Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 6. And today we're going to look at Deuteronomy 5, verses 6 through 21. You can turn there right now if you want to, but I'm just going to summarize and fly through those verses before we get into a little bit more deeply some of what the scripture says. But in these verses, God lays out some guidelines for his people and tells them what it looks like to live with him, what it means to have life with him, what it means to to follow the guidelines so that they could walk closely with God. And so he says this, he says, I am the Lord your God who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. That's the setup. It's not, I'm just giving you a bunch of rules because I like rules and you need to follow the rules. He says, I am the Lord, which is a huge statement in and of itself that we could talk about all day. That he is the one who who can do anything, who controls everything, who is the boss of everything, who is over everything. And in fact, the Bible describes God's greatness in so many ways. And if, sometimes it says things like, the earth is like his footstool. Like everything that's too big for us and too hard for us control, to control, the great natural disasters that cause us to fear and things like that are like nothing to him. They're like, oh, it's a hurricane that's like may be powerful enough to wash God's toe if it happens to be sitting on his footstool. Like, God is just so big, so strong, so high, so, so far above everything. So he says, I am the Lord, your God. So the, the mighty God, the one who is above everything, is identifying himself with these people. And he says, I'm the Lord, your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, who pulled them out of slavery. And then he goes through this list of guidelines because he's the Lord. He says, you must not have any other God but me. In verse 8, he says, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind. In verse 11, he says, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. In verse 12, he says, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. In verse 16, he says, honor your father and mother. In verse 17, do not murder. 18, do not commit adultery. 19, you must not steal. 20, you must not testify falsely against your neighbor. And 21, you must not covet. And we ask, uh, you guys might probably are familiar with these, people talk about all these commands, the Ten Commandments, and they're very common and very well known, but a lot of times we just think of them as rules that God laid out, but what we see here is it's designed so that God's people could walk closely with him. If we ask the question, why did he give these commands to his people? The answer is because he wanted to teach his people how to be near him. He wanted to teach his people how to walk closely with him. And 
even though these commands aren't foreign to us, and some of us might know them very well, sometimes we get confused about the reason that we're given these commands. Sometimes we get confused about why God actually told his people to do or to not do these particular things. And we've been told many times by our culture and maybe by people around us that by following these rules that we're good and God loves good people and that's how we earn our way into his good graces. And that couldn't be farther from the truth. That is a horrible lie that somehow has crept its way into Christianity that's in the United States and around the world today in a lot of places. And the reality is that there's no way that we could earn our way into God's good graces. That that message is so far from the truth. God didn't give these commands so that by following the rules we could become lovable to him. The law doesn't help us earn our way into God's good graces, but rather points to the fact that we truly and desperately need grace itself. Listen to this from Romans 3, starting in verse 19. It says, Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given. For its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now, God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. There's so much in that, and it's a huge passage, and it's amazing. And when I read that, I get excited because it says that I'm a failure, and I know I'm a failure, but God doesn't ever fail. And that he's chosen to to look at people like you and me who struggle and have more than issues and problems. We have a disastrously difficult situation that we're in, in that we are sick and we can't do anything for ourselves. And the law shows us that. But God has made it so that anyone, no matter who you are, who has faith in Jesus Christ, can be made right with him. So the law doesn't make us more lovable to God. It shows us that we don't have any excuses. It shows us that we're guilty and that we're all sinful. And that's what God's law does specifically and expressly for those who aren't believers. That's the purpose of it. It points out the reality that we are all sinners and that we need God. But amazingly... That's not all that God offers in Scripture. That's not the end of the truth that he gives to us. And what we read is the story of Christ and what he has done for us. The fact that the King of Kings, the highest and most mighty one, chose to stoop down and die a criminal's death on the cross to pay the price for our sins. That the one who is going to receive all the glory... One day, Scripture says, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to scream out that Jesus is the Lord. And and that's how it's going to be. And that is who He is. But that God, who has no equal, chose to stoop down and die for you and for me. And, And that's the beginning of the Gospel story. That God would do that for us. That God made a way for us to be made right with him apart from the law because we couldn't do it. Because we couldn't keep all his commands. Because we couldn't live a right life. It couldn't be done. So Jesus came and did for us something that we could never do for ourselves. He gave us grace. And we earned absolutely nothing. But God bestowed on us a mighty and beautiful gift and brought us near. God's law shows us how much we need the gospel. But once we've received it, and once we believe in him, it has a different purpose for those of us who are Christians. It it actually allows us and teaches us how to walk closely with God because we love him and because he loves us. We don't follow the law so that we can belong to God, but we follow the law because we belong to God and because we love God. We follow the law because God loves us. And we want to constantly be close to him. We can think of it like guidelines that he's given us in order to keep us close to him. Just like the guidelines that my parents gave to me in order to keep Heart Bear close to me, 
The point of that wasn't for my parents to just give me a bunch of rules because they were like, you're having a little too much fun playing with that bear, so we need to put some, some rules on this. But they knew that if they gave me some guidelines about what to do and what not to do, that I would be able to enjoy life with Heart Bear and not end up tragically losing him like actually happened. And so when God gives us guidelines in his word, the reason that he does that for us is because he wants us to be able to walk closely with him. Further on in Deuteronomy in chapter 6, it says this, Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. And you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road, when you're going to bed and when you're getting up. Tie them to your hands and wear them on your foreheads as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And this explains that the way that we as believers love the Lord with all our heart, all our soul, and all our strength, which Jesus said is the greatest commandment, the one that uh, encompasses everything. In fact, it's, it's so important that it is the one defining thing about what it means to be a Christian, to love God with every part of who we are, with all that we've got. And the way that we believers actually do that is to be committed to walking in a way that pleases the Lord. When you love someone, you want to live in a way that pleases them. If you don't do that, if you say you love someone, but you don't want to live in a way that pleases them, there's a disconnect. If you say that you love someone, but that doesn't show up in the way that you live your life, or in your desires, the likelihood is that your love isn't actually as real or as present as you think that it is. And so, what it means for us is to be committed to following what God teaches us to do in His Word. The guidelines that He's laid out for us are not just rules, but they're a plan that God has given us in, in order to teach us how to be close to Him because He wants to be close to us. We don't follow these guidelines so that we can be loved, but because we are loved. And there's a couple things I want to point out, a, f a few things that these guidelines, that the law, that God's Word accomplishes for us today. And number one is that the law teaches us to live like God. And the big goal for us as Christians is to be people who follow Christ. Um, in fact, whenever I talk about being a Christian to to people, especially when I write it down, if I talk about it in an email or something like that, I don't like to say Christian, I, I like to say Christ follower, because it puts it in such a, more, such a clear way that's not about anything else except for following Christ, and that's what we want to do, and so what the law teaches us, what God's guidelines teach us, is to live like God, to follow the example of Christ, and, and there's a great verse for this in Leviticus 11, verse 45, and it says, For I, the Lord, and the one who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And that's the story that we told in the beginning. That's the story that I, I mentioned, that, that God rescued his people from a dire and desperate situation. He said, For I, the Lord, and the one who brought you up from the land of Egypt, that I might be your God. So he's saying, I saved you from a desperate situation when you couldn't save your... And then he says, therefore, you must be holy because I am holy. In other words, he's saying, I rescued you. I saved you. So be like me. I rescued you. So live life like I do. Follow my example. And, and it's beautiful that Christ gave us the example that he did give us. That God didn't just send us down a book from heaven and tell us, okay, follow these rules and live like this. But God actually came down himself and he showed us what it means to live life where we put other people first, where we serve our neighbors, where we love our enemies, where we do everything without arguing and complaining. And the list goes on. Ultimately where he said he didn't come to be served but to serve and to give up his life as a ransom for others. And that's the goal of all of our lives, not that we would die for other people's sins, but that we would sacrifice our desires, what we want, for the good of others around us because we're following the example of Christ who did that in the ultimate way for us. And so when we follow God's guidelines, when we choose to live holy lives because our God is holy, we do it because he rescued us. We do it because 
he wants to be our God. And we do it because of the great price that he paid so that that would be possible. And the second thing is, beyond the fact that the law teaches us to live like God, is that God's law and God's guidelines and God's word teach us to live for God. So we live like God, but it also teaches us to live for God. Um, one of the most famous verses, in fact, I saw um, a recent statistic about the most searched verses online, and this was in the top five, is uh, Romans 12, verse 1, and it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, to give your bodies to God because of all that he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way that we worship him. And what it's saying here is that we are people who are called to live in a way that pleases God. We're called to live for God. We're to give ourselves everything about us as a living and holy sacrifice for God. Because of all that he's done for us. When we live in a way that pleases God, we get this great benefit. And that is that our lives have meaning. That we give up living for things that fade away, that fail, that waste, um, that are here and they're gone. And we trade that in for having a deep and real and lasting meaning. An eternal impact because what is done for Christ doesn't fade away. Jesus said that we're people who are called to store treasures up for ourselves, not here on earth where thieves break in or there's rot or rust, not where things fade or where things can get spent, but to store up our treasures in heaven where they last literally forever. And the goal of God's word for us, the way that he teaches us how to live, is that we would be people who are able to do that. We're people who are able to live for God. And this is so exciting because so many of us live lives that in a lot of ways aren't all that exciting on a day-to-day -day basis. On the way up here, I listened to uh, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer in the car on the way up here. And it was great. It was very exciting. Their stories are like super adventure. They're like finding gold and pretending to be pirates and going swimming all day, every day, sneaking away from their parents. Don't do that to your counselors. But... Um, it was very exciting. It was action-packed all the time. And then I, one of the things I started thinking about is the reason this is so exciting for me to listen to is because this is very different from my normal life. Like, this is very different from how I normally live day in and day out. There's a, a stark contrast between Kelly Hayes and Tom Sawyer. And that's probably a good thing. But he's doing a lot of exciting things in the, in the story. And a lot of, a lot of us... And a lot of people your age I see bored and I see seeking satisfaction uh, in all kinds of ways and never ultimately being satisfied. I see people who are struggling and hurt and depressed and confused about what life is all about because you've been told, rightfully so, that you're all amazing and wonderful and special but you don't feel all the time like that's true and you just don't know what really your life is about, or what it's supposed to be for, and what God's Word says and informs us on this issue is wonderful because He says, whatever you do, even if it's the tiniest little thing, whether it's even eating or drinking, you're supposed to do it for the glory of God, that you have this great call, that even if you're literally sitting down and eating Cheetos, you can do that for the glory of God. And that these amazing things that that we read in, the, in stories like about Tom Sawyer fade because Tom Sawyer was doing things for the glory of Tom Sawyer and the enjoyment of fun. But believe this, God has said that in every single thing that you do, you can do it for something way better than that. You can do it for the very glory of the almighty, incomparable God. How huge is that? And so he's able to transform our seemingly wasted, boring, silly aspects of life and give them new meaning. For instance, uh, if I were to go home after this week and just spend like a whole day sitting on my couch watching Hannah Montana reruns, because they're funny, um, that would probably be a wasted day. But if I went home 
sat on my couch and watched those same Hannah Montana reruns, but I invited my neighbors from across the street to come over and hang out with me and spend the day with me and laugh at old cheesy Disney Channel jokes with me, that would be meaningful. Because those are people who don't know Christ and who need people to reach out to them and serve them and build a relationship with them. And by, by looking at it through a, a lens and by having the goal of living for God, something as silly as watching Hannah Montana can turn into something as meaningful as doing something literally for the glory of God, which is an amazing thing. And that can happen in every single aspect of your lives. In everything that you, can, you do, it doesn't just have to be for you. It doesn't just have to be for something that's passing or fleeting. But it can be for the ultimate purpose, and that is the Lord. And the third and last thing that I want to mention is that not only does God's guidelines teach us to live like God and teach us to live for God, but this is my favorite, that it teaches us to live with God. It teaches us to live our lives actually alongside Him. Uh, James 4.8 says this, Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And this, she starts out with this great and wonderful promise. Come close to God, and God will come close to you. Now, that's big. And for those of you who might be struggling this week, and a lot of times in camps and things like this, it's really easy to, to smile and put your best foot forward and act like everything's all good. Um, and I understand that. But for those of you who are struggling and dealing with some difficult things, I would encourage you to consider this verse, what, what God says here. It says that if you come close to Him, He will come close to you. It doesn't say if you come close and get your act together, if you turn your life around, if you clean yourself up, if you can finally deal with that thing that you don't understand, if you can finally overcome that issue, then God will come close to you. It doesn't say any of that. It says that if you come close to God, he will come close to you, period. And then he continues it on because we are all sinful peoples. And he says, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And that could be the <coughs> subtitle to every one of our autobiographies. It could say, Kelly Hayes, loyalty divided between God and the world. Because that's the way that we live our lives. So often we live our lives that way. And it's so uh, sneaky the way that the world and the way that Satan operates so that we can think that we're doing things for, for God and for his glory and for his pleasure when really we're living our lives for ourselves. Or we think, if I give my life you know, 50% to God, I can give the other 50% to me and to what I want or whatever. But God's word teaches us that we're to let go of that. It literally says to wash our hands and to purify our hearts, to, to let go of the things that pull us away from what ultimately matters because those things that we're living for are not the things that God is walking towards. And if we're wanting to be people who walk with God, we need to be people who are walking in the same direction as God. Because if he's going this way and I'm going this way, you can guarantee that the more time passes, the farther away he and I are going to be. And so what God's word does, what God's laws do, what God's guidelines accomplish for us is they show us how we can live life with God, how we can remain close to him. God, God teaches us to walk in the same direction that he's going. And he teaches us to follow him and he teaches us to be near him. And I don't know about you guys, but the, if you think about how great this is, it should change everything. Because the ultimate motivation that that the Bible gives us is that we would be able to be with God. If you look at the Psalms, David says things like, this is the only thing in the whole world that I want, to look at your beauty and to be with you. There's no equal to God's glory. There's no, there's no equal to his splendor. There's no match for his love. There's nothing that can touch any attribute that he has. And he says that he wants to give everything so that he can be with us. And if God is like that, if the ultimate reward for everything we can do, if the best thing that we can ever get is God himself, and God's word, God's guidelines teach us how to be close to him, how can we let go 
How can we not pursue that? How can we not be people who are chasing after that one ultimate good of walking closely with God? And if it takes following some guidelines that I don't understand or that are hard or that I struggle with, we need to understand that that is worth it. And so here's a takeaway for you guys. That God has rescued you. That this idea of Christianity isn't just something about, that we find in the hymnals and the songs that we sing. It's not just something that we talk about at camp or at church or when you're uh, wherever you might do that. It's not necessarily just a group affair. But God particularly, individually, loves you. And he died so that he could be close to you. The ultimate price, where he himself said that there, there isn't any greater, bigger, or stronger love than this, than someone would lay down their life for their friend. And in Romans it says that God did it for us when we weren't even his friends, but at just the right time he came and died for us while we were still his enemies, while we were still in sin. And God loves you absolutely that much. And because of what he's done for us and because of the price that he's paid for our sins on the cross, we have this great call. We have this great meaning for our life. And we're called to live like him and with him and for him. And we're not earning anything. We're not better than anyone else because we follow the laws. Because if you're honest with yourself and you look at yourself, you can probably tell that we all fail. We all fail often, but God doesn't. And that's what's so incredible about this whole story. And so if we live like God, the world will see his love and will see his power. And if we live for God, we're going to have great meaning and purpose in our lives. And if we live with God, we're never going to need to fear. We're never going to need to be afraid because the ruler of everything is on our side and he's walking with us because we're walking with him. And so, we need to make the most of the opportunity that we have now. Not let time just slip by and uh, miss out on the opportunity that God is giving to you to turn towards him, to follow him more closely, and to be close to him because he's done so much to be close to you. Make the most of this week. Make the most of this summer. Make the most of right now. By taking what God's word says seriously, and by following him closely. And I appreciate you guys letting me speak to you this morning. And this lesson in itself is kind of just setting the stage for what we're going to talk about for the rest of the week. And it was really important to express some of these things about what it means to follow God and why he has given us the guidelines that he has given to us. Because I think a lot of times it's easy for us to be confused about a lot of things concerning the Christian life because we're confused about why God tells us to do the things that he tells us to do. So let me just end this by saying one last thing. That God gave you the guidelines that he gave you because he loves you. And that's it. Because he wants to be near you. Because he loves you. Because he wants to walk with you. Because he loves you. And if you guys are curious this week, today or whatever about maybe some of what that means or how that plays out in your life or gets involved in some of the things that you're dealing with, please talk to your counselors. Like they're here for a specific reason and they're uh, very wise. Um, you can talk to, you, to the faculty members. Uh, they love music, but they love you and they love God more than they love music. And you can always come and talk to me. Uh, the most important thing that you can do this week is to turn more towards Christ so that you can be following him more closely. Can we pray? Dear Father, I just thank you so much for each of these students that are here this week. And God, I just pray that you would be with them, that you would be speaking to them, that you would... You wouldn't let this be a wasted opportunity, but that because of your word and because of your spirit, their lives would be changed, that they would seek you more fully, that they would follow you more closely, and that they would take you so much more seriously. Because God, we know that in our world, in our, in our culture, and in our own hearts, it's so easy to push you to the back burner. It's so easy to um, just forget 
the great price that you paid for lowly sinners like us. So be working in us. Encourage us, challenge us, stretch us. And give us a great week, not just because we grow in our music, but because we grow in our faith and our love for you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys so much.